Well, good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I'm so glad that you're here to, to worship God. And, and uh, at this time, uh, okay, where's, where's my wife? Where'd she, she must, oh, right there. Okay. She's, she's hiding. There she is. Um, at this time, um, we'll dismiss the Sunday school to go down with, with Wendy. And for the rest of us, let's grab our Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1. Sometimes we um, forget the basics. And that's why I took the time to talk about the resurrection. You know, sometimes we get so used to God that we forget how miraculous His work is. The resurrection, come on. Someone rising from the dead. Someone coming back to life. You don't really believe that, preacher, do you? Come on, you're an you're educated guy, 21st century American. You don't buy that. I do buy that. Lock, stock, and barrel. Because it's fact. It's absolute fact. And it's, it doesn't make sense to those who are not in Christ. If you're not in Christ, this stuff doesn't make any sense to you. If, you, if, you are, if you're not walking with the Holy Spirit, the, God's Word is not going to make any sense to you. And so we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to receive from God. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we ask that the Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into the truth. We pray that these scriptures would, would leap out upon the page into our hearts. Lord, discern us. Show us. Where we stand with you, Father God. Are we unsaved? Are we carnal? Are we spiritual? Lord, I pray that you would help us to see Jesus through these passages. That we would have the proper perspective. That we would be operating in a kingdom economy instead of an economy that is dependent upon circumstances. And Lord, I thank you for this day. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would just open up these things that we may better walk with Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'd like to uh, begin with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, we're going we're gonna to bleed into chapter 2 in this, in this passage. And so in verse 17 it says, If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, to conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, falls away. The, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, he is the stone which the builders rejected and has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble 
being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that they may speak, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Bit of a lengthy uh, passage. Um, but these are the words of the Apostle Peter. And Peter was with Jesus from the very beginning. He was one of the original disciples. And I hope that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ now today. And we tend to, you know, think of these guys as superheroes of the faith. And, and in some ways they are. But I want you to know that they are people with frailties just like us. We tend to glorify the past. Sometimes to a point where it's unrealistic. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't look to the past. I'm not saying that we shouldn't look uh, back. Because I think it's important to look back. I think it's important to look back to see what God has done. And Peter is an individual that we can look upon whom I think, in the end, he did very well. Now, in his early days, he was very ambitious and, and very outspoken. And oftentimes would get himself into big trouble. And in fact, he was even rebuked by Jesus Christ and told to get behind him, you know. And, and so here we have Peter. He's much older now, okay. In fact, he is nearing the end of his journey with God. And that's especially played out in his second letter that he writes. <clears throat> but here in 1 Peter, he is talking about Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. And down through the annals of history, people have wondered, what, what is my purpose in life? And maybe as a believer, you've wondered, what is your purpose in this life? And of course, as Christians, we have all the Sunday school answers, right? Love Jesus, spread his word, you know, and these are all true, okay? But I would say our chief purpose is to glorify God. To give God glory. We have the Bible. God's Word. This does not contain God's Word. It is God's Word. From cover to cover. From genera Genesis generation. From Genesis to Revelation this is the Word of God. And Paul in, in 2 Timothy tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. That all Scripture is profitable. And one of the things that we need to remember as believers is that we need to put our hope and trust in all of God's Word. The context of the whole. I can't tell you the number of people, the number of Christians that I run into who forget what their purpose is. They get off on, uh, off on bunny rabbit trails and they think they need to add to the work of God. And as I said earlier, before we read this passage, the last words that Jesus said on the cross is, it is finished. If we think that we are in control of anything, we are sadly mistaken. God is in control. Now you say, well, I can do this. And I, yes, you can obey God. You can, you can be in obedience to God. But the bottom line is you're not in control. Even in your obedience, your obedience does not guarantee an easy life. Your obedience does not guarantee finances. Your obedience doesn't guarantee health. Your obedience only guarantees that you belong to God 
and that he will come back for you. In fact, the scriptures seem to teach opposite, that in this world we will have trouble. So I'm not here to soft pedal this to you. I'm here to tell you that being a Christian is the most incredible and awesome thing in the world that you can do, but it is also the most difficult thing that you can do. And we live in dark times. And we live in a dark area of dark times. One denomination has, has deemed the, the Northeast as its number one mission field because they feel it's one of the darkest places in the country. And I would have to agree with them. I would have to agree with them. I think overall, the Northeast is incredibly dark. I think there are very strong demonic spirits that are in control of things. The Prince of the United States of America, he's got this nation on a bad course. And we know from Paul's letter to the Ephesians that we are in a warfare. Okay? A warfare against principalities and powers of wickedness in high places. And because we are in that warfare, I believe that we need to be glorifying God in our lives. Amen. Because it is the glory of the Lord that will gain the victory. You look at Israel and, and her battles and every battle that she was involved in, it was the Lord who gave them the victory. Amen. Or it was the Lord that gave them into the hands of their enemies. Either or. When Israel was in obedience, they won against great odds. When they were in disobedience, they could have a 10 to 1 advantage and they would lose. And so the question that I would like to ask is what do you crave? What is your number one craving? And there's a lot of things in this, in this world to crave. I, you know, I, I'm not one of these prudes that thinks that you know, God is you know, uptight and, you know, and he's always angry and he wants his people to be stout believers. <laughs> you know? You know I, I, I mean, I do believe that God wants us to run the race with endurance. I think we de do need to endure. But I don't believe that we're called to be sourpusses. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice. And rejoicing in the Lord requires perspective. And I believe that's what Peter here is trying to bring to us, some perspective. In verse 17, he says, If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges uh, according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Wait a minute, preacher. Are you telling me that God wants me to be schizoid? Panicked? Afraid? No, no, no. The fear that Peter is talking about is reverence and respect for God. Well, there is an element of panic in that as well, knowing that God is the only one that can destroy your soul. He's the only one that can cast you into hell. And he's the only one who can save you. So we, re we reverence him. We reverence him. And we're supposed to, notice how he puts it, your stay here. This world is not your home. What do you mean it's not my home? I've lived here all my life. Yeah, a life that is like a vapor. Here one moment, gone the next. When you put it in the light of eternity. This is not our home. This is not the final resting place for us. We know that from Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says the dead in Christ shall rise. So even if you have dead relatives in their graves, it's not their final resting place if they're in Christ. Guess what? It's not their final resting place even if they're not in Christ. Because at the end of the millennium, there'll be the great white throne judgment and all the wicked dead will also be resurrected. And they will be judged. And they'll be found guilty. And they will be cast into Gehenna. You see, resurrection is our goal. To be resurrected by Christ. To be redeemed completely. Our redemption is complete in our salvation experience. 
but our redemption is an ongoing process in the sanctification of our souls and ultimately it is not finished yet until we are given our glorified bodies that is resurrection The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So whether you're a believer in Jesus Christ or whether you're a non-believer, you're going to get judged by God. The difference is the believer will have his works tested by fire where the unbeliever will have himself burned in the fire forever. That should, that should inspire some fear in your heart of God, some reverence for him. But we don't stay there. Verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold or silver from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. If you're born again of God's spirit, okay, and whether actually I'll, I'll, I'll recant that, whether you're born of God's spirit or not, you are here today by God divine appointment you're not here by accident you're not here by circumstances there may be those may be the vehicles which got you here but I want you to know that you are here by design by God's Spirit to hear the Word of God and all of you are at different places in your lives you all have different temptations. You all have different sins. You all have different struggles. And I'm here to tell you that God, that Jesus is the answer to every one of those struggles, that he is the one through his precious blood, if, he, if you believe in him, has made you clean. But I also recognize that there is an ongoing process because we are told at the end of 1 Thessalonians that God will sanctify us, th you know, spirit, soul, and body and so we know that our spirits are sanctified born again if we believe in Jesus Christ right what did Jesus say in John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life do you believe that I do and, and as I look at other scriptures that deal with our salvation experience, when I look at the book of Hebrews, it tells me that if I'm a believer, I'm saved to the uttermost. If I'm a believer, I'm under the ministry of the great high priest, Jesus Christ. And as long as he lives, his ministry continues. And how long is Jesus going to live? Forever. So I will always be under his banner over me, which is love, right? We sing that song. And so therefore, I am saved to the uttermost. Satan can't have me, can't touch me. He can do things to my body. He can mess up my, my earthly life, but he cannot touch my salvation. Because God chose me before I chose him. And to the normal human mind, that doesn't make any sense. That's not fair. That's not fair. God chose you. What, what makes you so special? Well... To quote Captain America, nothing. I'm just a kid from Warnoco. He was from Brooklyn, so I have to say Warnoco. <laughs> nothing. I'm just a kid from Warnoco. That's it. A kid that recognized his need for salvation. That's it. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we are saved. The, 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 the apostles in the book of Acts said there is no other name in which a man can be saved other than the name of Jesus. Jesus himself said that if we are whosoever, if we believe in him, we're saved. What more do we need? But yet we doubt, don't we? Let's be honest. We all have moments of doubt when we think, am I really saved? And it's because we wrestle with our own flesh and blood. First. Paul makes that very clear. That, that there is a battle going on between the Spirit of God who, who has been deposited into us as a guarantee of His return and our flesh. 
what you're, what you're saying, in my, my physical body, do I need to, you know, whip my body with whips and, you know, no, that's not what, when I say flesh, I mean, that's part of it, but it's, but it's, but it's more than that. It's that old nature, that old man that you used to live by who demands his own way instead of God's way, who puts his own interest above others' interests, who does not want to obey God and is not able to obey God, and that is why the law of God was given to expose the old man, to show you that you cannot work your way to heaven. But yet, perfection is the requirement. So without Jesus, we're, we're in a boatload of trouble. That's the whole point. Jesus came and died for sinners so that sinners could be redeemed. The redemption is all through the entire Bible. Even as early as Genesis. What did Abel offer up as a sacrifice to God? A lamb. Was that lamb guilty of, of sin? Did the lamb cause Adam and Eve to sin? No, that lamb was innocent. And through the shedding of innocent blood, God accepted Abel's sacrifice. But the works of Cain's hands were rejected. I have to believe that Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, they knew what God required of them for the redemption. See, it's always been the shedding of innocent blood. Without the shedding of innocent blood, there is no remission for sins. That's it. And the, and the Hebrew tradition was they were, to, you know, they were to take a little lamb without spot, without blemish, innocent, a year old or younger. You know, uh, real cute. And they were to take that lamb into their house. And that, and they were, t you know, and, and you know what happens when if you have children and and you know, um, and you bring a, a cute, fuzzy little, warm-blooded animal into your home, what happens? An attachment occurs. Names start flying. You know, they name the thing, and 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 it becomes one of their best friends. And 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 that was on purpose. God wanted the, these Jewish people to get attached to that lamb, because then four days later. They had to slit its throat and offer its blood up on the doorpost initially. That's what Passover was all about, putting that door, the blood on the doorpost so that the death angel would pass over and not take the firstborn of their home and of their sheep and of their cattle. How terrible. That cute little furry, fuzzy little lamby lamb being slain because of your sin and mine. It was supposed to elicit a response of, oh, oh. And John the Baptist, the real high priest, he declared Jesus Christ early in his ministry, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God wants you to love him so that you can understand his sacrifice. Amen. Wow. We murdered Jesus with our sin. We are all guilty of, of deicide. But praise God for some other words that Jesus said. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He, he took murder one and he dropped, out, dropped it down to murder two. Involuntary manslaughter. And because, and because of that, we can be forgiven according to the laws of Israel. Remember the cities of refuge? Ever hear of those? The six cities of refuge? And how in, in ancient Israel, what would happen if, 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 if someone was, was killed accidentally? The, the, the guilty party would flee to the city of refuge. And the reason why he would flee to the city of refuge is because the, kins, the near kinsmen of the person who had been killed would be chasing after him to kill him because it was the job of the nearest kinsman to avenge the blood of his, of his brother. 
And so, so this nearer kinsman would chase this guy and they would get to the city of refuge and, and, the, and the one who did the killing would present his case before the, the, the priests and the Levites of that city. And so if they determined that it was an accidental death, then the avenger of blood couldn't touch the person who was guilty of, of the killing. But there were some conditions for that person. They had to stay within the city of refuge. If they left the city of refuge and they got caught by the avenger of blood, guess what? He was within his legal bounds to kill him. And you say, well, how long would they have to stay in the city of refuge? Until the death of the high priest. If that doesn't smack of Jesus Christ, Amen. right? Amen. I could see the city of refuge representing Israel. Because that was, the, in the Old Testament, that was the only place where mankind could be saved from the avenger of blood. Until when? Until the death of the high priest. And then once the death of the high priest happens, you're free to go anywhere you want in the land. And Jesus Christ is our high priest. He died for us so that we could be free. You see, if Jesus did what the disciples wanted, you, we would all have to become Jewish. We'd all have to become Jewish citizens if we wanted to be in the kingdom of God. In fact, the millennial kingdom would have been almost a thousand years over with by now. Okay? But see, God knew exactly what he was doing. The church, the creation of the church, was not a knee-jerk response to the rejection of the Messiah of Israel. No, no, no. God knew Israel would reject him. He still held them accountable for the prophecy in Daniel 9, because he prophesied against the city of Jerusalem, and he, and he told the, the, the Jews that your enemies are going to come in, your enemies are going to wipe you out, and your enemies are going are to kill your men, your women, and your children, and not one stone will be left upon another. He told them that this would happen, and it did. But he was not caught by surprise. He knew exactly what was going on. And the church is not a knee-jerk response. It is chosen before the foundation of the world Amen. to be a part of the kingdom of God by God himself. Every person who receives Jesus Christ as Lord proves that they are chosen. That's all you got to do. Ask Christ in your heart and boom, you show that you are chosen. And everyone who rejects Jesus Christ, you show that you aren't chosen. And I'm here to tell you that if you ask Christ into your heart, he may not guarantee you easy times in your life, but he will show you for the rest of your life how much he loves you, how much he wants you, how much he, he, he really desires your company. But if you reject him and continue to reject him and you go to your deathbed rejecting him, then he will show you all eternity how he has rejected you because you would not confess him before men. This Lamb of God should be our craving. Right? It says that through Him we believe in God. Because we know God raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory and our faith and our hope in God. Verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and the sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. How do we make sure our stay here on earth is proper? We love one another with a fervent heart. Jesus said in John 13, 35, he said about the, about the non-believers, they will know that you are my disciples by your love that you have one for another. And how do we know that we are a disciple of Christ? John 8, 31 and 32, he says, Truly you are my disciples if my words abide in you and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. We, know, we, dem, we, we take God's word into our heart. I would recommend that you memorize God's word. That you would take the time to memorize. I do. I en encourage you to read it devotionally. Don't try to come up with the theological arguments and stuff, but just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I do. But then I also think you should study God's word thoroughly and theologically. 
so that you know what you believe, so that you can walk in the conviction of your beliefs. I believe in this. I really do believe that Jesus Christ is coming back, that the rapture of the church is imminent. I believe the church has always lived in the end times. The end times began in the first century because of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. There need not be any prophetic sign before his return. The church is going to get raptured. And that's an incredible thing to look for. In fact, it's called our blessed hope. Our blessed hope. And so what do we crave? Are we craving the things of this world or do we crave Jesus? No, no don't get me wrong. Jesus also said, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. I believe that we can live an abundant life on this earth. I believe that we can love passionately the blessings that God gives to us. I believe that we can love passionately our friends and our families and our co-workers and stuff. I do believe that, but that love for them cannot be the same as the love for Almighty God. Jesus Christ must be our first love. That is the first and greatest commandment, that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's number one. But I do believe that we can love our families. I love my family. I love being with my family. I love my son. I love my wife. I love my cousins. In fact, I miss my cousins and my sisters and my aunts and my uncles who are no longer in the area. And there's a part of me that grieves because they're not here anymore. Some through death and some have moved away. And I do believe that God gives us family for a reason. And I believe that that's what the local assemblies are, is they're families of God. And we're supposed to fervently love one another. And no matter how much we love, we can always love more. We can always love more. And, and, and you know what? In the dark times... I believe we can demonstrate our love the most when we say to God, you know what, God, this, this, what's going around me stinks. I don't like this. I'm not happy about this. I, I'm, you know my heart, you know, I'll, but you know what, God, I love you anyways. And I trust you. And, I, and, I, and thank you for my friends and family who are around me who can help me. That's, what, that's the whole point of the body of Christ. We all have different gifts and callings and abilities and we're designed to to be there for one another like a body you know our human bodies have ears and eyes and nose and a mouth and feet and legs and arms and a torso and a brain and if any part of that gets chopped off that's a mutilated body it's it's it, it can't function at its highest ability can it thank God Jesus is the head because if the head gets chopped off, it's all over. You can live with a severed limb, you know, but you can't live with a severed head. But the cool thing is Jesus Christ is our head, and he's not going to be severed. He's not going to be severed. In fact, he told us, did he not say, I will never leave you nor forsake you? He will never be severed from those of us who believe. I, you know, I, <laughs> he's just so awesome. This craving should create a desire to get away from malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking. Evil speaking. Do you know that, that Enoch had prophesied that the Lord would come and punish the evildoers? And one of the things that he punishes the evildoers for is their evil speech. That they sp spoke against him. And you're saying, okay, well, guess what? You're the body. If you're a Christian, if you're born again of God, evil, uh, evil speech directed at you is directed at Jesus. Persecution of you is directed at Jesus. Because in the book of Acts, what did Jesus say to Saul of Tarsus? He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? What was Saul doing? He was throwing Christians into prison. He was at the, the stoning of Stephen, giving his approval. He was, he, was allowing, he was part of murdering believers. 
And Jesus said, Saul, why do you persecute me? He didn't say, Saul, why do you persecute my church? He said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And so believe you me, you don't need, that's why we can take that word, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. We need to let God have the vengeance. I disagree with our president who encourages people to take vengeance upon their enemies. No, 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 no. Vengeance belongs to God and God alone. Because only God can execute absolute righteous vengeance. What are we supposed to do? Quick to hear? Slow to, list, uh, slow to uh, speak? And we're not to give the devil a foothold, are we? Amen. It's hard. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. Not by might or by power, but by my spirit, right? That's how we do this. All right, well, so, so the, the craving and the choosing. Look at verse 4. It says that if we are believers, we come to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And verse 5, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Did you know that you're a stone? You are a living stone. I didn't say you are stoned. I said you are a living stone. Okay? Jesus Christ is the first fruit of the first resurrection. He is the chief cornerstone. He is a living stone. And if you want to do a cool study, word study, study the word rock or stone throughout the scriptures, and you'll see it always talks about Jesus. And there's an, there's an uh, uh, episode in the Old Testament about a, about a rock. Actually, it occurred twice. Moses, the mighty prophet of God, he's leading the people of Israel in the, in the wilderness. They took a, an 11-day journey and turned it into a 40-year escapade. Okay, and so here he is with these, these cantankerous Jewish people, okay, and they're thirsty, and they're like, ah, we're thirsty! And so God says, look, I, what I want you to do, Moses, is walk up to this rock here, and strike it with your staff, and, and water will come out of it. And so, lo and behold, Moses walks up, strikes the rock, water comes out, and the people drink. Problem solved. Later on in Moses' ministry, he has a similar, I mean, they're in the desert. Okay? Water is a precious commodity. And so, the people are thirsty again. And... You know, God tells Moses, go to the rock this time. And see, this is where we need to listen carefully to what God is telling us. He tells Moses, go to the rock, and this time, speak to the rock. Well, apparently, Moses must have not have gotten a good night's sleep the night before, because he comes out with his staff, and he starts reaming out the people, you rebellious Stubborn, evil people, you want water? Fine! Smack! He smacks the rock again. And water comes out. And then afterward, the Lord says, Moses, we got to talk. Guess what? You're not going into the promised land. Did I not tell you to speak to the rock? And you struck the rock. Now, I mean, come on. Isn't that, that seems like a minor infraction. He smacked a rock. Oh, he had a bad day, God. Give him a break. What is up? He did more than that. He misrepresented God to the people. He told the people that God was angry. God was not angry with them. And he disobeyed by striking the rock. And I believe Moses messed up a, a, an incredible witness of the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. You see, 
His first coming, he came to die for our sins. He was struck for our iniquities. Isn't that what Isaiah tells us? Amen. He was bruised for our sins. And by his stripes, we are healed. When he comes a second time, he's not going to get struck. Nobody's going to be smacking him over the head with a rod. No, 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 no. He's coming back as king. And people are going to be able to speak to him face to face. And so Moses blew the, the model by striking the rock a second time. And you know what? If you want to get really theologically deep, in a sense, he was almost crucifying the Savior twice. Christ was crucified once. Christ tasted of the wrath of God once, never to taste of God's wrath again. That's what, that was that whole purpose in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there be any other way, take this cup from me. What cup? The cup of God's wrath. And the book of Hebrews tells us that, that he's done that once, never to do it again. And it's so cool how, how connected God is with us. We literally are his. Do you realize, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are seated with him in heavenly places. Wait a minute. My feet are on the earth, preacher. Where's your head at? There is a connection. You have an organic, spiritual connection with Jesus Christ if you're born again. The Spirit of God in us connects us to Jesus Christ. And, and right now, we are seated with Christ on the Father's throne. His Father's throne. And that's why we can have boldness to bring our prayers to Jesus because we can access the very throne room of God. And that's why Paul in that, you know, in Ephesians 6 talks about, you know, pray that I may be offer, you know, be able to preach the gospel everywhere. And prayer is so powerful. And you know what prayer is? It's not, it's not a religious exercise. It's just communication with God. You're just talking to Jesus. You know, telling him. And, and, and what is our communication like? An another illustration that, that we're given is that we're his bride, his virgin bride. And so the question is, what, what kind of bride are we? Do we nag him? Got a big, long, honey, to-do list? I want this and this and this and this and this. Or do we say to him, you know what, honey, you're the most awesome person in the universe. You are the bomb. There's nobody like you. I'll let you and God work that out. I have to admit, sometimes I'm a nagging wife. You know? You know? But then there are times where it's like, man, Jesus, I just love you. There are times when the glory of God just comes upon me through music or through the written word or through the landscape of, uh, of, our, of our planet, especially our country and stuff, and the Holy Spirit just, just comes upon me. And there's just this, this spiritual dance between me and God, you know? And he's loving on me, and I'm loving on him. See, his love doesn't cease, you know, but me, I, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm like a dog. Attention diverted. Who? Oh, that's right. I was loving on you, Jesus. Right? Right? The concerns of this life, you know? But this, getting back to being a living stone, guys, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are a living structure. We are living stones being fitted together. God's in control. He's the mason putting it all together. And the mortar between us and Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And the promises of God are not maybe, but yes and amen. When God says he's going to do something for you, he will do it for you. And we need to just step into that and gain the perspective. It doesn't mean that all our sicknesses will be gone. Not necessarily, but a lot of them will. Does it mean that all our debts will be paid? Not necessarily, but many, many of them will. Or maybe God will. There are times when I was reading online of, of, of a 
dear friend of mine, Jessica Tower, where she was being profiled by certain, a certain police officer. And these, um, you know, and so her case was being reviewed and, and there was talk of kicking her out of her apartment. And she's got like four or five kids. And, 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 the, and this police officer was, was saying untrue things. He just didn't like the way she looked and stuff. And so, so she talks about how these social workers came and, and, and the, there was a man and a, a young woman and the man goes, God brought us here for this time for you. He said, Jessica, you're almost done with school. It's no wonder that all this stuff is coming against you because the enemy knows that you're about to launch into whatever God has for you. <laughs> These are social workers in the People's Republic of Massachusetts. Comrades. <clears throat> you know? And, and God took care of her need Amen. in that particular time. And I, you know what? I don't think God always does it the same way all the time. I think he likes to keep us on our toes. It's more fun that way, isn't it? All right? And then finally, getting down to verse 11, getting down to the point, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Jesus is our example, right? We, we see here earlier that he was the chosen stone, the chief cornerstone, the rock of offense. How did Jesus operate when they, when they were accusing him of things? Kept his mouth shut. And, and he started getting help from unlikely sources. Pilate tried to get him off. He really did. Read it. Read the gospel accounts. Pilate examines Jesus and he figured out the only reason why Jesus is standing before me is because those religious leaders are jealous. That's why he's here. So I'll just have him whipped and send him home. And what happens when he came out? And he says, I find nothing wrong with this man. What do the Pharisees say, the, the leaders? Hey, if we didn't have reason, we, we wouldn't have brought him here. He's guilty. And they incite the crowd. The very, probably the very same crowd that a week later who are saying, Hosanna. Yeah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? Those very same people are now crying, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. And what does Pilate do? He says, hey, I have a tradition. It's the Passover. How about I release one guilty person? Here's Barabbas. Here's Jesus. Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a murderer. And, and I believe Barabbas is a model of the devil and the Antichrist because he's a murderer. The devil is a murderer, right? Isn't that the scripture says? He was a murderer from the beginning. The first murder was not Cain killing Abel. It was Satan killing Adam and Eve. That was the first murder. And we're told that, that Satan is a thief and a liar and a murderer. Okay? And so I believe that Barabbas is a model of the Antichrist because we know enough Hebrew to figure out what his name means. The last half of his name means is Abba, Abbas, Dad. What is Bar? Son of. So his name technically means son of the father. What father? He was a murderer. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus, didn't he not say, he predicted that they would do this. He said, I come in my father's name and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name and him you'll receive. And I believe that was a double prophecy. One of Barabbas and one of the Antichrist yet to come. Because that's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to come in the place of Christ. He's the instead of Jesus. Jesus. That's what he is. And Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? And what do the people say? 
we have no king but Caesar. Really? You're Jews who can't stand these Roman oppressors, but when you are given the choice between the true king and accepting the leadership of an evil Gentile ruler, you'll take the evil ruler. Why? Because their flesh was evil. Now, I want to make something very clear. The Jews did not crucify Jesus. The Romans did. And it was our sin that put him on that cross. We crucified Jesus, in a sense. So I'm not blaming the Jewish people at all, except for the fact that they're as guilty as we are. We're all guilty, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. So Paul, or Peter is saying here, listen, you're a soj sojourner here. Don't get caught up in the fleshly lusts. Walk in such a way that people see what kind of person you are. Let them see the gospel of Jesus Christ in your speech, in your conduct, in your, in, in your spirit. You know, why do we need to worship God in spirit and in truth? Well, we need the word of God to tell us that we're sinful and need a savior. But we also need the spirit of God to lead us and guide us into the truth. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't understand this book. And the only reason why I understand that I need a Savior is because the Spirit of God made that real to me. And the only reason why you understood that you needed a Savior if you've accepted Christ into your heart is because the Holy Spirit made that clear to you. And there's no work that you can do that can substitute for the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't care if you haven't missed a Sunday school class for 50 years and haven't missed a, a one day in church for, for 75 years and you've got pins down to your ankles on, you know, you know showing your good works in the church, that's not going to save you. And I don't care if you were born into a Christian family, that doesn't make you a Christian. And I don't care if you walk into a church every Sunday, that doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is that you know God personally. Personally. But if we do know this God, what kind of conduct do we have? When things are going bad, do we throw a hissy fit? Throw a temper tantrum? I'm not going to serve you and God no more. You didn't give me my wants. Maybe God only wants to give you your needs at this time. I do believe God gives us wants. I don't think everything God gives to us is, is just a need. He's, he's a good father. He's a good dad. He loves us. But he wants us to have a conduct that, well, let's finish it up in verse 13. It says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors or those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorant of foolish men. As free, not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. I believe that God wants us to have holy conduct as well. Now, I'm not going to get legalistic about it. If you fall short on this, 1 John 1, 9 is still there. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's never too late. If you've got breath in your body, it's not too late to ask God to forgive you. And if you're bumming out right now, it's not too late. I mean, God can turn it around. I do know that we are called to run a marathon. And, and, I, and when, when I was younger, um, I used to run an average of five miles a day. Every once in a while, I would double that. I would try to run ten. Okay? And, and, and I'm not a long-distance runner. I'm more of a sprinter. That's more my style. I play a lot of football. And that's what fo football is just a bunch of sprinting. Boom. You sprint, come back, huddle. Boom. You sprint, come back, and huddle. You know, but, but I wanted to be in better shape, so I would try to run long distance and stuff. Wasn't very good at it. My time, I did six-minute miles. I had a friend of mine who could do five-minute miles. And when we were on the soccer team together, he'd always lap me, you know, and stuff on the long distance runs, but in the sprints, I'd always blow his doors off. He couldn't keep up with me in a sprint. I couldn't keep up with him in a long distance run. But anyways, um, 
I remember running these, these 10 mile runs on occasion. And man, those first three miles are a killer. Oh my God, it's like my body is screaming, what are you doing? You're not a motorcycle or a car or a horse, you're a human being. Why are you running? My, your knees are gonna give out, your, the head's pounding, you know, the lungs are gonna explode. And then mile four comes. I'm like the bionic man. I'm just running. Smooth as a jaguar, at least in my mind, you know? The aches and pains are gone. The flaming lungs have calmed down. And from mile four to mile seven, I can re leap tall buildings in a single bound. Right? And then mile eight. It becomes hard again. But you know what? I had a goal. The goal was 10 miles. Not seven, not three, 10. And it was that goal that kept me going. Who is your goal? Make Jesus your goal and you will continue to run the race. Put your faith in anything less and it will crumble under your feet. And you'll find yourself literally running in sand, going nowhere fast. See, we can't do the heavy work. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. How do we live a righteous life before others? Not through our righteousness. Not through your righteousness, not through my righteousness, through his righteousness, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I hope that's you. I hope that you're running that race. And brother or sister, if you're in a hard time, I want you to know that there is help for you in Jesus. But remember what Paul, or, well, I think Paul wrote Hebrews, but whatever. The writer of Hebrews said, he said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And those who believe in him must believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him. It's got to be diligent. Just, just be diligent. You know? And, and you may not get the answer right at this moment. Okay? It may take, but you might. You might. But the thing is, we got a race to run. You know? And the Lord is coming back for us. This, this place, what we're doing, this is temporary. What we want to build is eternal things. And that is by, you know, I can't think of anything more eternal than God's word being firmly planted in our minds and our hearts and being what we crave more than anything in this life. Let's pray. Father, um, Lord, some of us are <laughs> suffering from sugar withdrawal and chocolate withdrawal from Easter. And uh, some of us probably ate more healthy than others, Lord. But God, I do know that um, the enemy does not like it when your purpose is accomplished. When the people of God are studying your word and loving you. When the people of God are sharing their faith and others are getting saved. When the people of God are are putting their money where their mouth is and they're tithing and they're, and, and they're just pressing forward with you, Father God, in the area of finances. I know that, that the enemy does not like that. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us the fortitude to be the people of God. When, when things are rough, when, when things are not going our way, Lord, help us to run the race. Lord, Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. And we are living stones fitted together with him. And you tell us in Romans 8, 28, that, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Lord, help us to love you and to recognize that by loving you, we are called according to your purposes. Not our purposes, your purposes. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. I thank you for this body. I thank you, Lord God, for Jesus Christ rising from the dead and giving us the 
the Holy Spirit. And, and I thank you for the gifts of the Spirit and the Word of God and, and all the, 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 the different churches that are out preaching the gospel, the men and women who are sharing their faith. Lord, we know that, that your kingdom is going to come and your will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven at some point. And Lord, let us run this race with endurance. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's Spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus. Accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible-preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week, and may God bless you all the days of your life.